Hello, friends. As always, I say when someone orders one of our videos, I'm so happy you have it. And I'm especially happy that you have this one because I love the title. The Rapture Generation. Do you really think that we could be the generation when we see the rapture, when Jesus says, come up hither? Now, you know, Jack, you're one of the few who really uh, puts the emphasis on the rapture. You've talked about it on our program many, many times. Would you like to just allude to it for a moment here? Oh, the rapture is found in many places, but 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that have died, that you sorrow not as, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. He raises them first, and then seven years later comes back with them, so he brings them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the dead in the clouds to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ha, ha, one another with these words. He's coming soon, ladies and gentlemen. How good it is to know that Jesus is coming again. Now with that in mind, take a look please as we enter in to the first part of this video, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Take a look please. Amen. Many Christians today believe that we are approaching Armageddon, whoa, that word means something. And that the four horsemen, you know, there are four horsemen that Jesus gave in the book of Revelation, four of them, that would point toward Armageddon, all right? Now, I'm going to ask Jack, if he would please, uh, to give us uh, a, a sort of a, a look at what Armageddon really means. What does it really mean, Jack? Everybody wants to know. It's the greatest time of war in the history of the world. We talk about World War I, World War II, where 50 million died. Well, World War III, as Pope Francis calls it, is what the Bible calls Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. And we're going to see one half of the population of the world die during that time. And we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And we have the white horse, red horse, black horse, and pale horse, a greenish, sickly looking animal. We're going to deal with all of it today, but listen to this. Here is what the Bible says about it. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, this know also that the last day, perilous, dangerous time shall come. In Luke 21, Verse 25, Jesus said, Nations will be in distress with perplexity and mass confusion. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, The last for that day is great, so that none is like it. Daniel 12, 1, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was. And Jesus said, Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be again. And there are going to be three invasions that we're going to see today. And we've got the Muslim people saying they're planning for it. The Israeli people saying, so are we. And many nations of the world are getting ready for this hour of history. And today, I'm going to tell you, the only good news is this. I believe born-again Christians are going to be evacuated, lifted out of here before it begins. Why? Revelation 16, 16 is during the seven-year period. But we leave just before that. When? Revelation 3, verse 10. I will keep you from, not through, from the Greek word ek, the hour of testing which comes upon the whole world to test them that dwell upon the face of the earth. Oh, Jesus, come quickly. Amen, Jesus, come quickly. Absolutely. Now, we're going to deal with those four horsemen. I'm talking to a girl just this morning, and she says, four horsemen? I never heard of that before. Well, we're going to go one at a time and let Jack explain why the Bible so explicitly gave us four horsemen that points to the coming of the Lord. I like the first one, especially the white horse. 
this horseman is riding on a white horse. I like that, don't you? What does that represent, Jack? Okay, in Revelation 19, 11, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, sits on a white horse, and he comes to put an end to the battle of Armageddon and bring peace upon the earth. So this individual in Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, wants to imitate the Christ who comes. And so he comes to power on a peace platform and he has a bow without arrows. And he comes to challenge the world. And the Bible teaches in Revelation 13, verse 1, this is the world dictator we call the Antichrist. And he has control over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, and all the world worships him, thinking he's that Christ, verse 8. But there is a false prophet who reigns with him in Revelation 11 to 18. And he has the two horns of a lamb identifying him with the Christian faith. For John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So this is a Christian personality reigning with this world dictator. And he's promoting the one world religion, the one world church. And soon I'll be telling you where this is all headed because we are facing that hour very, very soon. Well, now, this one gets the power on this peace platform. How do you know that? Daniel eleven twenty one. he comes in peaceably. Verse 24, he enters in peaceably. And he makes a seven-year contract. Daniel nine twenty seven, And that's called Shabuah in Hebrew or Heptad in Greek and means seven years. But after 42 months, it's broken. Now, this thing that's going on with... ISIS isn't going to last. Why? Because this leader must come and make this peace and ha things have to stop at that point. And after 42 months, all hell breaks loose. And I'm telling you folks, we are right at that moment. And all hell is going to be here very, very soon. What'd you say, Jesus? There never has anything been like it in the past, nor will there ever be anything like it again in the coming hours, but I will return to put a stop to it. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, and set up my glorious kingdom on earth over Jerusalem. Luke 1, verses 32 and 33. And that's the story of the white horse. He's coming. Oh, yes, I love it, Jay. Now, down through the years, uh, there have been many organizations who have tried to bring peace to the world. Is that not right, Jack? What are one some world of the... order, yes. All right, a one world order. Well, it started 2,000 years ago with the Illuminati in Egypt. And the years grew. And finally, they started coming to this part of the world. It wasn't long until we had, for the second group, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and then the Bilderbergs, the Club of Rome, the European Union and the New Age Movement, all working for this one world religion. And Rexella, they said, and this was Rabbi Hagian, many centuries ago, when we have a 10 division world empire, our Messiah will come. That's Whoa. the announcement that he will be here. And Saint Jerome, who wrote the Catholic grade version, the Latin Vulgate said, when the ten division world empire comes, our Jesus will be here. And we believe that Christ could come at any time because everything is now in place for this great war. It could never happen until our generation is going to see it. A ten division world empire. Did you know we got it already? I want to put it on the screen. They've divided the world up into 10 division world empire, America, Canada, Mexico, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Japan, number seven, South Asia, Central Asia, number eight, number nine, North Africa and Middle East, and then 10, the remainder of Africa. We've already got it. I can't believe yes. that, Jack. And it was the Club of Rome, Rexella that put this together and it's on the drawing boards and waiting to take shape. Plus, the Bilderbergs a few years ago meeting in Virginia created a system to put microchips on every human being on earth by 
2017. And we're gone when that happens. Now, a false prophet arises with this Antichrist, and that is his job to do. In chapter 13, verse 16, he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man, no man, world control, might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. A score is 20, so three score is 60. Six, 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 that infamous number. And by the way, Big Brother has arrived, and both Japan and America now have computers that do billions of calculations per second. It's near. All right. Well, there's that white horse trying to set up a, a peaceful government that's worldwide. We have a 10 division world empire. It fails. All right, let's look at the second horseman. The white horseman, the second one, comes on a red horse. I'm going to ask Jack again. What does the red horse mean? In Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we have this rider on the red horse who takes peace from the earth. As I said a moment ago, the peace contract lasts for 42 months and then all hell breaks loose on the earth. And who is the one that's behind it? Ezekiel 38, verses 1 and 2. Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, all cities in Rosh, or Russia in Greek, or Russia in English today. And guess what? This writer says in Ezekiel 38, 11, I am going to take peace from the earth. But he is the one associated with Meshach, Moscow, a city in Rosh, Russia. Oh, Jack, so interesting. Called the Red Horse. Now, you know, we don't have to wonder if this horseman is ready to ride because of the political battles and religious jihad. Take a look, please, at some of these headlines. Islamists gather to fight Muhammad's promised Armageddon. Israel told prepare for Armageddon and forget U.S. help. Pope Francis warms up. What? World War III, and ISIS threatens Vatican, urges Muslims to kill every crusader. They say we're going to conquer Rome, break the crosses, and enslave the women. Italian party leader ISIL threatening entire world. Oh, dear. Here's a report. Merger of ISIS and Al-Qaeda could cripple civilized world. Well, here's that red horse. How far will he go? Putin's push to recharge Russia. Putin to put Russian bases in Latin America and how U.S.-Russia enmity aids Beijing. And then from contempt to camaraderie, they're talking about Russia and China. And U.S. Admiral China to have nuclear missiles on subs very, very soon. Do you see, friends, how that red horse could ride? Oh, my, Jack, we're there. Well, we've been talking to you about Armageddon and Russia, and there's no doubt this is Russia, as I've shown you in the past, because Magog was the name used by the Greeks for the Scythians who populated Russia. Meshek was the original name for Masakh, Muscati, Moscow, and all cities in Russia today. Now, Russia and her Muslim allies found in Daniel 11:40, Isaiah 17:1, Ezekiel 38:5 to 7 and Psalm 83 verses 5 to 7 are defeated in Ezekiel 39 verses 1, 2, 12 and 13. 7 months it takes to bury the dead and every available human being is at the job. And then China comes down the great hordes from the east, Revelation 16:12. The Bible is so clear, and that's why these guys are really friends now, and they're going to come together. They have signed the Shanghai Agreement Treaty, where Russia and China will fight together. Now, this will be the bloodiest battle in history. Revelation 14, verse 20 says that the blood flowed to the horses' bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. A river of blood 200 miles long, that's the length of the nation of Israel. And the battle is described in Revelation 9, 14 to 18. 
Loose the four demons in the great river Euphrates to slay a third part of mankind. And the number of the army was two hundred thousand thousand two hundred million. And by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, smoke, brimstone, atomic warfare. Oh, folks, God help us as to what's coming. Thank God the rapture will be here and we'll hear the cry, come up hither. Revelation 4, and we'll sweep through the heavenlies in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. That's our only hope at this point. Oh, what blessed hope that is. Now, Jack, you've been talking about war, but the second part of that verse talks about terrorism. Take a look, please, uh, friends, at what happened to our neighbor in the north, Canada, gunfire erupts at Parliament. And terror hits Canadian capital. That's right. Going on. Wall Street Journal. Oh, my, oh, my. Gunman's journey to terror. And then Muslim convert. Oh, dear. A suspect in Ottawa attack. Canadian soldiers run down impossible Quebec terror attack. There's a second city in Canada. Three Toronto teenagers attempt to join ISIS, and then the homegrown jihadist threat grows. Well, you know, they're reaching out online to recruit young people. Terror connection not ruled out in hatchet attack, the police say. Scotland Yard, minimum of five Britons join ISIS, what, every week. And Islamic State crisis, 3,000 European jihadists join the fight. Oh, Jack, I have to ask him this. Where will all this lead? This is what Jesus predicted in Luke 21, verse 9. He says, when you hear of wars and commotions, wars and revolutionaries, wars and terrorism, then know that my coming is near. Ladies and gentlemen, it has arrived. We have never seen such terrorism in the world. And it's the prediction of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. He says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How was it in Noah's day? The whole world was filled with violence. But that's the greatest sign that the rapture is about to take place. For Jesus said, when it's happening, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And that, of course, is Luke that same chapter 21, verse 27. And he says, the generation that lives to see this shall not pass. We are that generation. And that is the same chapter, verse 32. Mm, Jack, I'm going to go on to the third horseman, the black horse, global financial destruction. Here you see it, stocks swoon in frenzy day. Clamor for stocks resumes, but fears lurk in market. Risk of deflation feeds global fears. And Dow erases gains for a year as global fears rattle the market. And here's one more. Venezuela's currency hits new low. That is worldwide, friends. That's not just here in the United States. Rex, hello, that's Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And the rider on the black horse has a pair of balances because of the economic problems and the hunger that's going on. And it says that he's crying out a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And a measure was a day's wages, and all they could get was 16 ounces of bread or whatever they were buying. Now, Jesus talked about that in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 10, for in no one hour is her judgment come. Verse 17, for when in one hour all her riches has come to nothing. And verse 19, for in one hour is she made desolate. It's here. Oh, Jack, it is here. And now I want to go to the fourth horse, which is the pale horse that pictures disease. Take a look at this. World Health Organization, West Africa, Ebola. Deaths near 4,500. Ebola infection rate may rise to 10,000 new cases per week. And then Ebola outbreak could last forever. Mosquito virus that walloped Caribbean spreads in U.S. West Nile virus threat growing. Deadly bird flu mutation sparks contagion concerns. And then, of course, the killer Spanish flu. Could it happen again? Superbugs could cast the world back into the dark ages, David Cameron says. I'm going to go right to Jack Van Impey to explain this for us. Oh, what a book. Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. He said, I saw a pale horse, and his name was called Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over one-fourth of the population of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death, and 
and the beasts of the field. We're the generation. All four things are here now. And Jesus is about to come. We all remember how we had hurricanes. Oh, unprecedented. Tornadoes to be remembered. Mudslides, typhoons, unprecedented storms. Poor California, my heart just went out to those people. We should be praying for all of those who lost everything. They came home. It was all gone. Don't forget them, but do be praying for them. Jack, uh, the Bible talks about all this. Oh, Rex, now they say this has been the worst in a hundred years, breaking records from 1880. Why? Because Jesus said, this is what you're going to see with great momentum just as a, about to return. And that is in Matthew 24, 7, that there would be earthquakes and famines, pestilences, disease to animals in great abundance. And then he said in Luke 21, 25, that there would be nations in distress, in mass confusion. Why? because of all the things happening in the next verse. The sea and the waves are roaring, and that's because of the hurricanes, and typhoons, and mudslides, and adds in verse 26, men's hearts will fail him for looking after those things which shall come to pass on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Tornadoes, it's all here. Oh, yes, Jack. I didn't think it could get any worse. But something came out of Sydney, Australia that was absolutely horrifying. I'd like for you to take a look at what they had to say when they saw people with their hands on the window. And uh, they had gone into a chocolate cafe. Oh my, Lynch. see there? <laughs> Sydney, siege, sparks, terror, fears. Now this was an act of hostage right there. And Australian hostage drama ends in deaths and questions. Oh my, oh my. Going on terror free for years. Now Australia confronts extremists. It's spreading everywhere, friends. And here, Lone Wolf, that's what he was. Australian hostage taker had violent, unsettled past. You know what he was trying to do, Mr. Heron, while he was inside that cafe. He wanted everybody to know his grievances. And this is what he had to say a member of the new religion of moderate Islam is not a Muslim. You cannot be moderate and be a Muslim. Can I break in there, Rex? All oh, right, absolutely. He said, I'm sick of these modern and moderate Muslims. And he's talking about folks like the ones here in Dearborn and in Canada, Alberta. They're not trying to kill everybody. And he says the trouble with them is they're not obeying their Quran. And we have this new religion in the, among the Muslims of moderation. Well, thank God for a change. All I've been reading is about blood and bloodshed and killing and beheading and using machetes on people. But that's what he says. If they would obey their Quran, they could not be moderate. And they're right, because 273 times the Quran says you must kill. 164 times holy war, jihad, to gain control of the world. And 109 times beheading, because they are infidels. And that's anyone that is not a Muslim. Watch out. It's dangerous if they obey their book, the Quran. You know, Jack, I didn't think it could get any worse than no. what we yeah. saw in Australia. Yeah. And then a Taliban gunman stormed into a Pakistan school. Death toll reaches 141 and growing in massacre at Pakistan school. You know what? 132 children were killed. Oh, how that breaks my heart. Taliban massacre students. And then look at this, if you will, please. Taliban gunmen stormed a military-run school in northwestern Pakistan and killed at least 141. Of course, that's growing, people. Methodically shooting school children in the head and setting fire to some victims in a horrifying nine-hour rampage. I don't know, friends. I just have to call this very barbarian. I don't know how anyone can shoot a child, 
because they didn't do anything wrong. And actually, it was a Muslim school. Jack, why would they kill their own? I like what this book says. They are brute beasts. Jude one ten. Now hear me. Jesus loved children. And you birds, you murderers of these little innocent kids are going to pay for it. Oh, you didn't go in there with a machine gun. No, you took nine hours to go to each one of the 132 children and put a bullet in the head while the others watched. I've never heard of anything like that in my life. Even Adolf Hitler wasn't that bad. And you do it in the name of your God? Listen to me. Jesus loved those little children, and he said in Mark 9, verse 43, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he were cast into the sea. And boy, I'm for it. Romans chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, pictures these people. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used the seat. The poison of snakes is under the lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitters, and the way of peace have they not known. Barbarians. And God's going to take care of this, and soon. Why? My Bible has Jesus angry with this time of personality. He said, in Matthew 23, 15, Woe and you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one convert and when he's made you make him twofold more the child the hell in yourselves i agree thank you jesus but he wasn't too he said in verse 33 of that same chapter you bunch of snakes how shall you escape the damnation of hell oh this tender loving jesus he loved children and he won't put up with all of your murder in the name of your God. Hear me some more. Revelation 21, 8, the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and whoremongers and murderers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their park in the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 15, outside of heaven are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, and whosoever loves and makes a lie. And one day Jesus is coming back and we believe that as soon it could be 2015. Why? because of everything that's happening. But here's what happens when he divides the crowd, the good and the bad. He says in Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil as an angel, and you won't be getting 72 virgins. Verse 46, these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Not only do you get 72 virgins when you murder, but you have the privilege of choosing 70 relatives and others to go to heaven with you. Hmm, that's a strange way of getting saved. You know, Jack, I don't think that I have ever wept over a headline uh, like I did when I read about the children. And uh, I not only got some comfort in knowing that they are in God's hands and they will be judged, but also something else came to my mind. The children all went home to be with the Lord. Their fright was taken away. God gathered them, I'm sure, into his bosom and loved them. How wonderful to know. They oh. went home to be, all children go in home, right? Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14, all children in all groups, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslim, until the age of accountability, we can then think for themselves, are covered by the blood of Christ. Read Romans chapter 5, verses uh, 12 to 18. And that ch the, about age 12, and yeah, they can yeah, choose yeah. which path they want to take. Yeah. But how wonderful to know that. So the then Lord. they're covered by the blood of Christ and the cross, which you guys hate. And that's why you can so freely murder little children. Mm, oh, yeah. That's why Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. From Islam concerning our Savior, Jesus Christ, take a look. Shah Muhammad, Hasham Kabani has this to say, like all prophets, Prophet Jesus came with a divine message of surrender to God Almighty, which is, whoa, Islam.
This first shows that when Jesus returns, he will personally correct the misrepresentations and misinterpretations about himself. He will affirm the true message that he brought in his time as a prophet and that he never claimed. Look at that. He never claimed to be the Son of God. Whoa, I am going directly to Jack and ask him what the Bible has to say about that. When Jesus was on earth, did he claim to be the Son of God? Oh, Rexella, the strongest thing I've ever done, not against Muslims, but against the compromisers, the apostates within Christendom, and the time that the world hears about it. And one of them is this guy called Rick Warren, the pastor of America, yeah? He's the one that spoke at two Muslim conventions for this guy you just heard. And this is the guy that teaches that when Jesus comes, he has become a Muslim. He's been converted, and now he comes and preaches the message of Allah. And those who refuse to hear it are put to death. All Jews and Christians and others, non-Muslim, by Jesus, their prophet. And I'm going to tell you something. The same guy. Now listen to me very careful because, Rick, you have them together with you at the Saddleback Church and you're finding out all the similarities. This man already has said, Jesus never said that he was God. Well, I beg your pardon. You found your first mistake, sir. That is not what our Bible teaches in Matthew 27, 43. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. Mm. John 10, 36, I am the Son of God. John 17, 1, I'm the Son of God, and I like it even better in Hebrews 1, 8. This is the Father speaking to the Son that you say doesn't exist because he didn't have a son. The Father saith to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That goes a little farther. He calls him God, the second member of the Trinity. And that's Romans 9, 5, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and 1 John 5, 20. Amen for the Word of God. All right, Jack, one other question then. Christianity actually is built on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, right? Yes. Is that in the Bible too? Oh, 400 times this book says that Jesus is the way. I'm going after Wycliffe, Sills, and Frontiers, all Bible translators who've desecrated this book. And they made a new version for the Muslim world, and they removed Jesus as the Son of God 91 times. And I'm going to do everything again to get you guys to get them out of the ministry of translating our book. Why? Because they've committed the unpardonable sin. Whosoever says that Jesus is the Son of God, Allah says, will burn in hell forever. He says it eight times. You know what this book says? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Son of God is an antichrist. And we got Bible translators who are antichrist today. The Bible talks about Jesus being the Son of God. Would you elaborate a little more, please, Jeff? 400 times this book says Jesus is the way of salvation, but uh, many times it says the Son of God is the one who produced this salvation. Now, John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the Son they should be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the Son of God. John 3, 36, he believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And here it is five times in 1 John 5, and that's verses 11 to 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son does not have life. These things have ever written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm going to tell you something. The Pakistani Bible Society said to these translators, we don't want that Bible here. Too many of us have died for the Son of God, and now you're going to give us a version that you removed this precious thing, this precious Savior, this precious doctrine, 91 times. Keep it. Jack, you know, you're very, very vocal about correcting the misinterpretations. But when Jesus comes back, 
Well, he also correct those misinterpretations. Oh, that's a lot of baloney again. Listen, here's what Jesus taught, that he was God from all eternity, that he came and took on himself a body to die for sinners, that he came through the womb of the Virgin Mary, that he shed his blood for the remission of sins, and it's the only way to be saved, that he rose again from the grave and sent it to heaven, and he's coming back again to set up his kingdom. Now, here is what you say about Jesus, and I'm so sick and tired of hearing people say, well, they tell us they love Jesus, he's their prophet. Yeah, but here is what their prophet does, and it's totally against this holy book and against my God and my Christ. What? Jesus comes back and he says, hey, I'm not a deity. I never claimed that. We already proved that was wrong. And he said, it is my job now, because I've been converted since I left and become a Muslim, to come and straighten up all these misinterpretations. No, no. He said, I am now the evangelist for Allah, and I will serve as the chief lieutenant under Mukti, your Messiah, and it will be my job, according to Kabani, who heads up the Muslim movement of America, as he stated, to put to death every Jew and every Christian who denies this message. Jesus, the executioner of all those in all other religions, that's my Jesus, that's the Jesus you say you love. And by the way, if you love him so much, why do you kill everyone else who loves him? Some strange things. Jack, so very well said, but will you please tell us where all of this is found in the Quran? Folks, I'm not making this up. Here's where you can find it. Surah chapter 4, and that's what a surah is, a chapter. Verses 157 to 59, verses 172, 73, chapter 5, verses 72, 73, chapter 6, verse 19, chapter 9, verse 30, and chapter 19, verses 33 and 88. Look at it. Mm. Now, this past year, friends, I think you'll have to agree. The facts concerning Islam as a religion of peace has certainly been, uh, without reservation, revealed to be untrue. Take a look. ISIS death threats and child beheadings force Vicar of Baghdad to flee Iraq. They, they actually blew up 300 churches there. ISIS school jihad trained small children how to behead, torture, and use AK-47s. Al-Qaeda teaches on Twitter how to kindly cut off human head. Going on, British jihadist calls for Prime Minister to be beheaded. Is this a religion of peace? Going on, intelligence, Islamic State planning terror attack in the United States and Europe. And then, this is Cal Thomas, USA Today. ISIS claims to have agents in place to attack American cities. Chicago and Las Vegas have been mentioned as targets. And then four Islamic terrorists found in Texas in the last 36 hours. Of course, that was in October of 2014. Islamic State steps up anti-U.S. propaganda with calls to attack Times Square. And then ISIS urges jihadists to attack Canadians, again, 2014. And here, facing the threat of homegrown jihadists, Canada, and then going on here, oh, I can't believe this one, friends. Mom brags about sun, synagogue, terror, and she's referring to what went on in Jerusalem when four rabbis were killed in the synagogue and a policeman, her son, was one of those who did the killing. I can't believe this. Jack, that a mother would brag about this. The reason is not only do they get 72 versions, but they get to choose 70 relatives and friends to go to heaven. And so many times the mothers are rejoicing because now they've got it made, salvation for eternity. Uh, Jack, I've been giving all these headlines on killing. Would you please show us from the Quran exactly some of the surahs that speak about killing? There are hundreds. 273 different times the Quran mentions killing. 164 times it is through holy jihad, holy war, to control the entire globe. 109 times it has to do with, first of all, 
crucifixions and that's Surah 533 and then beheadings, a Surah 474. 109 times. I'm just going to give you five. Seize them and kill them, unbelievers, wherever you find them. Surah 489. Strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of God and your enemies and others. Surah 860. When the sacred months are over, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, arrest them, besiege them, lie in ambush everywhere for them. Surah 95. Believers, make war on the infidels who dwell around you. Deal firmly with them. Surah 9, 123. When you counter the infidels, strike off their heads. Surah 47, 4. Now let me tell you about Nolan Finley. He's one of the great writers for the Detroit News. And he lives right in this area. And the paper he uses, the Detroit News, goes into the Muslim area of Dearborn. But he has guts. Listen to what he said. I've always thought the best way to honor the 3,000 who are murdered would be to drop 3,000 bombs on their murderers. Through Iraq and Afghanistan, we've given our tormentors another 6,200 victims. That's through war. So maybe we should leave now and as we go, nail a note on the door that says, don't make us come back here because if we do, we'll flatten your miserable countries and everybody in them. There it is. Could this be the year 2015 when the Lord could come? Could it be, Jack? I definitely believe it could be. We're not setting dates, and I'm going to show you why right now. Rexella, there's so many of these backslidden Christians who don't want the Lord to come, and they're always trying to find excuses. Uh, that's why 2 Peter 3, 3 says, knowing this first, that there come, will come scoffers in the last days saying, oh, where is this coming? Nothing has changed. Baloney. Okay, first of all, there are those who say, oh, Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour knows no man, so we can't know. You don't even know what that means. <clears throat> first of all, Christ created the world, and I'm pretty sure he knows what he created and how it works. Right. Christ created the world, oh, yes, for by Christ were all things created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. That's Colossians 1, 16. Now, Anyone who ever says, here is the day and hour when Christ will return is automatically wrong. Don't believe them. Why? When Christ created this world, he knew that there were 24 time zones. So if someone says he's coming at one o'clock, he'll be wrong 23 times. There are 24 different time zones, and those 24 change into three days. When it's the 17th here in Michigan, it's the 16th somewhere else in the world, and the 18th at another place. So you've got three days and 24 different time zones, so you can't know the day and the hour. But he added in verse 33, if you go back and look at it, you will know when it's near, even at the door. How? By signs. In the Old Testament, the 16 Old Testament prophets give all their signs. And then in the New Testament, we have uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17 and 21, and then all of the book of Revelation, because in Revelation 22:16, 16, Christ says, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things, the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. And it totals a thousand signs, 500 pointing to his coming to the earth and 500 after he arrives. And oh, it's wonderful. Now, there's something though that has thrown every Christian off. No, they say, oh, we've always had wars, rumors, wars, famine. No, it's not that important. Why? Because they are tied in with two things that had to happen, and they never happened until our generation. And you know what? That is Matthew 24, 32. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise you, when you see all these signs in connection with the fig tree, that's when I'm coming back. The fig tree is Israel. And that is Joel 1, 7, Hosea 9, 10. No doubt about it. What has to happen? They have to become a nation and they have to control Jerusalem. It only happened in your lifetime. In 63 B.C., Pompeius 
the Roman general went down to Jerusalem and took the Jews away. And for the next 2011 years, they were controlled by all the other empires. But on May 14, 1948, they raised the six-pointed star of David and called themselves Israel. And then 19 years later, they captured Jerusalem. Uh, why is that important? Because when Russia and the nations of the world fight the battle of Armageddon, they come against Israel. There was no Israel to come against in 1818 or 1914 until 1948. And they had to be in control of Jerusalem because they fight World War III Armageddon over Jerusalem. You couldn't do it until after 2030 years, 1967. Now we have the two signs. He says, when you see all the signs in connection of the fig tree, they control Israel and Jerusalem. That's it. All the signs then become meaningful. Now, here's another exciting thing. The Jews talked about a day as a thousand years in Psalm 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, 8 says that we Christians say a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. So each day is counted as a thousand years. Now, boy, is this wonderful. Hosea 6, 2. After two days, and this is Israel speaking, 2,000 years, he'll revive us as a nation. After two days, not at two days, 2,000 years, after 2,011 years, 63 B.C. to 1948. And they became a nation. And 19 years later, 2,030 years, they took Jerusalem. And he says, when these two things are there, we're at that hour. Russia could not invade them, nor could they have anything to do with coming after Jerusalem because it wasn't there until your lifetime. We are the generation. And that's why in Luke chapter 21, verses 32 and 3, he says, the generation that lives to see what I've just told you shall not pass from the earth. We're going up. Amen, Ooh, Rexella. Jack, that, that's tremendous. Yeah, yeah. All of this history. Can you believe how it's connected with the Bible? How it's connected with what the Lord said would happen? Oh, my, oh, my. The Bible is so very, very accurate. Now, you know, I've talked to people that said the Lord could come back at any time, His return. Sometimes they're not quite sure about what you're talking about when you say the rapture and the revelation. There are two events there, Jack. Uh, could you just quickly give us a glimpse of what those yeah. two events of his return really mean? First of all, none of the signs point to the rapture. That's been a misunderstood thing down through the centuries. All the signs point to something seven years later, his return to the earth. But you know why we can say that the rapture is near? All right. Now at Christmas time, you see everything going up five, six weeks ahead of time. So when you see those Christmas trees, you know that Thanksgiving is right at the door because that comes four weeks ahead. We can know that it's coming to the earth is right in the future because every sign is here. Israel a nation controlling Jerusalem. And he says, when you see those two, that's it. So we now know that every sign pointing to his coming to the earth is here. Therefore, we go home earlier, seven years before that. Now, the rapture is the literal, visible, bodily coming of Christ in the clouds to snatch out of this world in the twinkling of an eye every born-again Christian. What? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, frighten one another with these words. No, 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 <laughs> absolutely not. Comfort, amen. The ones who ought to be frightened are the ones that are backsliding and living like the devil. Now, the first thing that happens at the rapture is Revelation 22, 4. We shall see his face face, the face of Jesus. Oh, what a day that'll be. But the second thing is, our bodies are changed as we're going up in the twinkling of an eye. And that's 
Philippians 3, 21. He shall change our vile bodies that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Changed. That reminds me of a little story. I've been telling this for a long time and other preachers are starting to quote me on television. This Amish man and his son were talking. He says, Dad, we never see the world. All we have is this horse and buggy. Let's get out and do something today. So they're going down the road and the license plate in the back says, be careful where you step. Our exhaust is created by the horse. <laughs> and lo and behold, they see this mall. He says, what is it? I don't know. Let's go inside. And they see these elevators. The door is going open and shut, open and shut. And he says, what's that? I don't know. Let's see. And this little old lady, she can hardly make it anymore. <laughs> and she gets in. The door is shut. She says, Dad, it's going up, up, up. Now it's coming down, down, down. And out steps this gorgeous looking 21 year old woman. And he says, Son, go home and get Mama. <laughs> well, whatever it is, we're going to get new bodies. And that's the rapture. And then seven years later, Christ returns with his people, with his church. And that, of course, is. Jude 14, the Lord cometh with 10,000 for the saints to set up his kingdom here on the earth forever. And I want you to go on in a minute, Rick, so let's finish this. That is Luke 132. It's the prophecy of the virgin birth. And Gabriel says to Mary, your son shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And he shall sit upon the throne of David. Forever and forever and forever, because the world will never end. We're going to see more of that in a minute. Now, this program, we're going to be looking forward. We've been talking about, could the coming of the Lord be this year? Yes, it could, because of the things that had to happen have already happened. Israel's a nation. They, they have Jerusalem and so forth. Now, could terrorism, something that we're really seeing, be one of the things that we will face in the new year, and I'm going to point this out. Take a look, please, at this tragedy. Stronger than ever, jihadists kill 5,042 in a month. And then going on, Islamic State training pilots to fly fighter jets. Now, could this be a tragedy, Jack? I'm going to go to Jack right now. Could this be a tragedy it that they're, they're developing this? Twin Towers, another 9-11, but it says that they soon will also have the thing to do what Russia just did and shoot them out of the sky or go after them with their own jets. Dangerous coming. Oh, my, oh, my. And then we're going to be going on here, too. Oh, what's going on in the world right now? We'll see what could happen. Lebanese seek release of security forces captured by militants. And ISIS threatens, what? The Vatican urges Muslims to kill every crusader. That's the goal. Yes, it is. And uh, Representative Frank Wolf, American ISIS fighters could return to attack the United States. There are actually more than 100 Americans are fighting with a deadly terror group, ISIS. My word, I can't imagine Americans fighting with them. Going on, Islamic State graffiti found throughout Washington, D.C. Friends, you know, I, can, did you really get that? I just can't get over this. Graffiti is everywhere in Washington, D.C. in support of ISIS. Jack, uh, will you please sort of fill me in? Does the Bible talk about terrorism as one of the major signs before the Lord comes back, does it? Matthew 24, 37, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How was it Noah's day? Genesis 6, 11, the whole world filled with violence and terrorism. And ladies and gentlemen, I love 1 Peter 3, 14, be not afraid of their terror. I've had a lot of terrorist threats in recent days pray for me, but I'm not afraid. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Could churches, Christians, continue to be targets? In 2015, Islamic State destroys historic church in Mosul. Now, you know, Jack, I just want to stop here. Oh, whoa. 100 guards 
have been hired by a major church in Memphis, Tennessee. In fact, it's one of the largest churches in America, 30,000 members. In fact, Jack spoke there. They said, if you don't think that they're coming here, you're badly mistaken. We are hiring 100 guards to protect our churches. Now, they're destroying some historic churches. Do you think we're targets? This church is the Southern Baptist Convention Church. They are the strongest Protestant group in America and the world. 18 million. And this is the one in Memphis, Tennessee. Adrian Rogers, the great preacher, passed away recently. But a new man is there, and they have 30,000 attending. Now, he said, we've made up our mind. They're coming! And we are going to prepare. We're going to protect our people. They'll come into our churches like they did in Iraq and destroy 300 churches and kill thousands and drove the rest out. He said, it won't happen in our church, and I'm going to encourage other Southern Baptist churches to do it. And this was on CNN. And he said, we're getting 100 guards to protect us. We're paying them every time there's a service here. And we're not going to let them get away with this stuff. And boy, we need that. I'm going to tell you something else. We Christians, oh, we got to have peace, peace, peace. Jesus said, if you don't have a sword to protect yourself, he said, sell your clothes and buy one. Luke 22, 36. And I have, and so have our people. You know, Jack, it's something, though, in Mosul, I just want to back up here for one moment. That was once the heartland of Christianity in Iraq. They're all gone. 300 churches gone in Iraq. Just in the last couple of years. Yes, Jack. The Boy. Chaldeans, the oldest Christians group in the world, gone and because now, of Muslims. Yes, going on here, I'd like you to see something else. This surprised me. Destroying churches is part of Islamic doctrine. Whoa. Take a look, please, at this next article. CBN reported this on the 700 Club. A holy sanctuary, a place where you are safe. A church is meant to be a place to worship God, and of course, a place that's free from the evil and the outside world. But today, churches in America are becoming targets for protest, for predators, for violence, and even terrorists. And then Tim Miller, a former Secret Service agent, says the threat is rising worldwide. Violence against Christians is rampant around the world. It hasn't touched us as it has in other places. But if we think we are immune from that, we are sadly mistaken. We will experience that same level of violence and that same methodology that's coming to the United States. It is time for Christians to become educated about what's going on in the world. Do you agree with that, oh, Jack? 6,000 have arrived, they say, from the ISIS group. They're Americans who left here. They came out of Minneapolis and those places, Somalians, and they have trained and they're coming back from that place of training to destroy as much of American and Americans as they can. It's also happening in Canada. It's happening in England. But these 6,000 just came out on student visas. They've disappeared, the news on the major stations of America. They found 26 of them already making bombs. You think nothing's ever going to happen in America. It'll be the first time it happens on American soil. So prepare to meet your God and protect your churches. Take a stand. Oh, yes, we do need to take a stand, don't we? Well, could 2015 provide the means for a new kind of war. This surprised me, too. Take a look, please, at this. The new shape of war, the next generation of drones and robots, is changing the nature of combat and raising profound moral questions. Also, drones basis for new global arms race. Whew. They're saying, we've got to get in there and do it. German robots school U.S. workers. And <laughs> that's in Frankfurt. Artificial intelligence isn't a threat yet. 
Cool. And now here's Stephen Hawking, Britain's preeminent scientist. He warns artificial intelligence could end mankind by redesigning itself at an ever-increasing rate. I could not believe that. Jack, he's saying this could end mankind. He's an intelligent man, but the Bible says he's wrong. Why? There are six verses that are misinterpreted in the Word of God, and it's Matthew 13, 39, verse 40, verse 49, Matthew 24, 3, Matthew 28, 20, and Hebrews 9, 26. It says, end of the world. Don't believe it. It's a world without end, Isaiah 45, 17, and Ephesians 3, 21. Well, what's it talking about? It's talking about the end of the church age, which started at Pentecost, Acts 2, and it ends at the rapture. Now, as the rapture is about to happen, we're getting ready for World War III, but we're going to be kept out of it, Revelation 3.10. I'll keep you out of the hour of testing that comes upon the whole world. Then the peace program is set up, and it's set up for a period of just seven years. And that's when the Antichrist of Revelation 13, 1 comes to power, and he comes to power through a peace contract. He comes in peaceably, Daniel 11, 21. He enters in peaceably, Daniel 11, 24. Now, the shocking thing is that it only lasts for 42 months, and it's broken because Putin of Russia makes the move. He says, I'm going to go against them that are at rest, at peace. And that's Ezekiel 38, 11. Ladies and gentlemen, this is really dynamic stuff. And who goes to war? Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, all cities in Russia today, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 and 2. Presently, Russia is joining with Islamic nations, and they're going to join with him for the greatest war in history. And that is found in Daniel 1140, Isaiah 17, 1, Ezekiel 38, 5 to 7, and Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7. And then we see them fall, catastrophe, five, six of their armies in Ezekiel 39, verses 1, 2, 13, and 14. There's more. We see that they come from the Orient, Revelation 16, 12, hordes of Chinese for the battle of Armageddon, 16, 16. And by these three was the third part of men killed, fire, smoke, and brimstone, atomic warfare, unbelievable things happening during that hour. But here's the point. It's all against Israel. Now you know why I said what I said in the beginning. Nothing could happen until there was an Israel and in control of Jerusalem because that's what Armageddon is all about. And 18 times it mentions Israel as the battleground of the world. Ezekiel 38, verses 8, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, chapter 39, verses 2, 4, twice, and 7, 9, 11, 12, 17, 22, 23, 25, 29. It's here! This is a generation because it's the war of the latter years and the days, and Russia couldn't invade until 1948 or 1967 when they control Jerusalem and they go to war over Jerusalem, Joel 3, 2. Jesus is coming. Oh, Jack, in the light of everything that is going on in the world, how good it is to know that Jesus left with saying these words, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know the way that we can face what tomorrow holds and the way that we cannot be afraid is to have the Lord in our lives. Now, you ordered this video. You probably have accepted the Lord as your Savior, but if you haven't, or perhaps you're giving this to someone who hasn't opened their heart to the Lord, I trust that you will. Because, you know, nothing can fill the place in the heart that was really intended for the Savior, for God. Nothing can take the place of the Savior in your life. Have you really opened your heart? Maybe you're a church member. Maybe you go to church. I was. I was 17 years old when I opened my heart to the Lord. But one day I even led my high school friends to Christ. But one day I realized I just knew about him. I didn't know him. And then that night in my bedroom with my brother at my side, he led me to the Lord. I trust that you will pray this prayer that Jack is going to give right now for the Lord to come into your life, cleanse you, be your Savior, take away any fear of tomorrow because He could come at any time and you're ready 
if you have him in your life. Jack, would you pray that beautiful prayer of acceptance of Jesus? I'm going to say a few words to you first, and then I'm going to ask you to pray the words after me. First of all, I want you to know that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. I don't care what you've done. How burdened you are about what you've done. How convicted you are. You're living miserable lives. That blood will cleanse you. If you pray the prayer, we're going to pray in a minute. <clears throat> because it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hey, there's more. He not only forgives it when you confess it, he forgets it ever happened. What? Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8, 12. All you have to do is ask him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Good news. Wow. So do it. All right? Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden with burdens. Come, I'll give you rest. You can have that right now. Pray these words, Lord Jesus, Son of God for all eternity, one who took a body with blood, suffering as that blood was shed to wash me, me personally, from my sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I love you for what you did for me in all the world. Now, Jesus, I am asking you this moment to be my Savior, to come into my heart. And I'm so glad for another promise in the Bible. Titus 1, 2. This is from you. In guarantee of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised. Ooh, wow. So now I accept that eternal life. Come into my heart, Jesus. Amen. As always, I would say to you, please write to me. If you pray that prayer, if you open your heart to the Lord, I'll send you this little book of first steps in a new direction. There is my address. I would love to send this to you. And know that the Lord has done a great work in your life. God bless you as you walk with Him in the future. You know, I love this because so many people are afraid of what tomorrow holds. Keep your eyes on the Lord and your fears will vanish. How good to be looking to Him in this day and age in which we're living. We'll look forward to being in your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. And so do we so very much. Bye-bye.